Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sinzi, I host the Jake and Gino podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best line author, the G Daddy, Gino Barber. Gino, how's it going? Jake, you got your listening skills on today, bro. You caught me without the mic, caught me with my pants down, sort of. So I'm glad this is all about listening. <laughs> this is all about persuasion today. So um, it's going to be an awesome show. I'm really excited about this. And this is for all the real estate investors out there who are struggling with persuasion, struggling with negotiation. It's time to listen up. And then we're going to talk about keywords and persuasion in this podcast. So get out your pen and paper. It's time to take some notes in the show. That's right. Keep your pants on. We got a great <laughs> guest today. Today's guest is a licensed master trainer of NLP and has been in the training and development field for over 40 years. He specializes in sales, team building, and leadership skills. So without further ado, John Laval, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it. It is always our pleasure. Let's take it back. Tell us about how you got started in business so folks can get to know you a little bit. Uh, sure. I worked in small companies early on. Actually, I was a little entrepreneur probably when I was about 13. I probably shouldn't admit this on any kind of recording, but uh, even back then, I was probably selling little explosive things, you know, called firecrackers and uh, things like that. That's the good and, stuff, uh, made, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Made, made quite a bit of money, actually. You probably <laughs> had more, I probably had more money in my pocket on any given day than my dad made in a month. Uh, of course, he didn't know that. So, uh, but I had that, I, I kind of had that spirit anyway. So, but anyway, I got out of school, finally got out of high school, went to college. I'm not even sure why, but I went to college twice, went twice. And uh, I worked for small companies. I kind of liked it. And then I decided I was going to go work for a bigger company because I wanted to get some experience. So that's what I did. And I worked in just about every function of a company that you could possibly work in, except for finance and accounting. And uh, they wouldn't let me near the bank books, I guess, something like that. But I learned a lot, lots and lots and lots. And I had, I had about maybe four or five guys I worked for that I could say I actually enjoyed working for them, even though they were a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. But uh, I learned a lot from them. They kind of they kind of took me under their wing and coached me, you know, mentored me, told me little things you could do to change things and how to change things around in businesses, blah, 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 blah. Then one day I, I tripped over this thing called NLP. I mean, I wasn't looking for anything special. I was looking for some, some way of training better. That's, I mean, that's about it. Now, most people, they think NLP is about going and finding yourself. But I never thought I was I lost. That, I so. think that's like Buddhism or something, right? I don't know what it is. I don't know what they call <laughs> it. But at uh, any rate, uh, so, so I, I tripped over that literally and uh, studied it a lot, lot, lot. Ran into uh, one of the two co-developers, started training with him. That's Richard Vandal, the guy I was training with. Put together a whole bunch of different programs, things like that, blah, blah, blah. So that's how I got into this business and been in here for just about, in, I've been trainer for, for, like you said, more than 40 years, but doing NLP for just almost 40 years. So, so let's, let's define what NLP is for everybody. Just define neural linguistic uh, sure, programming. Sure, 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 sure. The tree letters pulling the wool sure. over people's eyes and doing like voodoo on them, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can shoot and electricity be, from your fingertips, right? And you'd be surprised what some people think it is. But literally, I mean, it's about how the brain works, okay? The three letters are for neuro-linguistic programming. Neuro for brain, linguistic for language, and programming, how we manage to run a you know, sequence things in our brain, mm -hmm. how we store information, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really about language and behavior. So how does your brain with your and how you use your language interact? So you can determine a whole lot just by really, really listening, but knowing what you're listening to or listening for. The whole set of skills easy enough to learn. And most people tend to overcomplicate things, of course. Let, let's don't have let, to overcomplicate things. Let's go, go let's go into the sensory modalities. You know, visual, right. auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, sure. and gustory. Let's let's go through them real quick. I want everyone to write sure. these down because now it's start start to shift the mind. Like you said, the brain works a certain way. If I'm yep. interacting with somebody, I really need to pay attention to them, lock into them, see what they're doing with their hands, see what they're doing with their eyes, see what they're doing with their body language. Cause really 10% of communication really is words. 15% maybe the remainder of that is all the rest of, of, uh, of um, whether it's body language, inflection of our tone, the way we move ourselves. Can you go through those sensory modalities, John? Yeah, sure. So basically what happens is this, we have an experience, like, like we're having one right now. Mm -hmm. And what happens when we're having any experiences, we're bringing in information and we only bring it into our five senses. We see, hear, feel, smell, taste. Mm -hmm. Now, once we bring the information in, and, and this isn't literally in your brain, like if I, if I you know, lopped off the top of your head, I wouldn't see filters necessarily, but we bring that information into our own filters, whatever those, whatever those are, mm -hmm. uh, how we grew up, uh, if, if we have religion, our religion, if we, if, we, if we have one or had one in any way our neighborhood, our friends, you know, all these things that we were growing up, we, we, we learned how to filter information. Mm -hmm. 
Then we store it in our brain. Then we re-represent the information in our brain. We either see it, hear it, feel it, smell it, or taste it, and any combination of those. Now, most people have a preferred system. Everyone uses all of their brain. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're going to get people running into people saying, well, I don't make, I don't, what do you talk visual? I don't, I don't, I don't see any pictures. Well, that's because they don't know how to see their pictures. Mm-hmm. Everyone's doing it. If they weren't doing it, they'd be dead mm-hmm. because the entire brain's always, always operating. Now, some people, of course, have a preferred system most of the time. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean they don't use the other ones. So, for example, you might like to see what's going on. You might want people to show you, literally show you on paper, figures, designs, things like this. Other people will have a preference for talking about it and hearing it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and this is important, this is really important, especially in any, any kind of deal, any kind of any kind of persuasion. I remember back when I was working in, in the company, and uh, my boss said, oh, oh, tell me, okay, he was auditory. I'll give it, I'll give that away. He's highly auditory. He said, tell me what you want in your budget, you know, for next year. And I said, okay, I go back, I, I type everything out, I hand him the report, put it on his he said, I put that on the desk. I go back later, probably the next day. And he goes, tell me what you want in your budget. I said, I, I, I gave it to you yesterday. He said, no, no, just tell me what you want. I go back. I'm frustrated, right? Mm-hmm. I do the thing again. I put the re- I did this three times before I got it. Boom. And uh, I was already studying NLP, by the way, and I missed it. It was in my early days. Mm-hmm. So he said, just tell me what you want. And I said, oh, I want this, 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 this. He said, okay, I'll get that for you. I'm done. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that simple. Mm-hmm. I have another wacky, really wacky, wacky Hold story. on, but before we get there, basically... Oh. People are receiving information differently. And if you can appeal to the way that they prefer to receive information, you're going to have better human interactions. Is that fair to say based on what you just said? Yeah. But you're you're going to be increasing your odds. And 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 uh I'm gonna take a real well, put sales your... aside though. Put sales aside no, for doesn't matter. and, and doesn't, business. Doesn't matter. Literally doesn't just matter. you want to have a good relationship with another human being. If you can appeal to the way that they like to receive information, you can improve your human relationships by doing this. So I, I'm guessing there's data on different personality types and how you know they receive information from these different sensory types and uh, and how this impacts interaction. No, wow. nope. There's no data. You just know this intuitively. We just know this because we studied enough times. And there's other information, by the way. One is by listening. Okay, because it's, here's the problem. Humans so this, are is, this, is, this is info on the streets. There's not even scientific. <laughs> it makes such perfectly clear sense to me. Like I get exactly what you're saying and I've lived it because I'm highly auditory. You give me like a, a stack of papers and say, you're, read it. Don't, you're just, just, I'm going to run away from you. you know, I don't, don't, don't even talk to me. You're scaring me right now. I don't want to read That's this. Right. Like, just tell me. <laughs> but I wouldn't even have to talk to you so much about it, except I know better because your eyes are going into auditory movement too. Whatever that means. Exactly. exactly. It is the voodoo, Gino. I'm out of here. He's scaring me. He's scaring me. Because in in addition to just the senses, what happens is when we're talking or we're processing information, basically, even if we want to propose questions or or we're listening, I can watch your eyes. So you're going very auditory. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. What does that mean? For the folks that are maybe like just listening, because we're on YouTube. Some people are watching YouTube. Sure, sure, sure. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the talking to you thing. If I'm gonna be, if I want to persuade you something, I'm gonna be doing talking thing, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna use, and, and you've you've used a lot of auditory words, just just while you were speaking before, and since you spoke with me anyway. Dude, you gotta, you, you gotta back this stuff up with data. You gotta do the research, man. It's it's gotta be out there. You are my anyway. research. Yeah, you are my research. <laughs> <laughs> because it's what's happening at the moment. Yeah. Now, now you might think that you know people might think, or you might think, well, I'm really, I'm really highly auditory. And that's probably true. There are times you're going to go visual. I may have to translate that visual, whatever it is, into auditory for you. Okay. So I'm collecting data while you're while we're interacting. I'm collecting data about what system would I be using mostly for you. You're also using a lot of kinesthetics feelings. Mm-hmm. Tell me I'm emotional, Gino. No, no, that's different. That's different. You might process information kinesthetically. If it doesn't feel right at the end of this, at the end of the define, define kinesthetic for me. What are we what are we saying here when you say kinesthetic? Kinesthetic could be feelings. Could be tactile sensation, uh, but not not so much like emotional when we think of that word yeah. being used as your emotional. Yeah. But every strategy, every decision, every decision strategy that people have is going to end up in a positive. In order for them to do the deal, whatever the deal is, it could be a yes. I'm going to buy, I'm going to I'm going to buy the car. Or yes, uh, thank you. I'm going to give you the keys to my car. I mean, whatever it is, is going to end up in a positive kinesthetic. If it doesn't end up in a positive feeling, you're not going to do it. So you might run an entire strategy in yourself, you know, decision strategy. Let's say. But if it doesn't feel good at the end, 
the whole thing doesn't feel good at the end, you're not going to do it. Like your gut okay. feeling almost. In some cases, you could call it your gut feeling. Yeah. Okay. You can call you can call it, uh, you know, it's a, it's a positive state, basically. You're going to feel right about it. Matter of fact, some people will say, even use the language. So I can tell in the language, you might say, well, uh, that, sound, that sounds like a downright good deal. Downright. That's where your eyes are going to go if you're going to be doing that and you're normally wired right-handed. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get too complicated here for you guys. But if your eyes went and you did it once or twice, look down to, the, down to your right when you describe kinesthetics, I know that's a feeling because that's where your eyes are going to go in order to process that data. Mm-hmm. And John, what I would say to everybody, as they're watching the news or watching TV and an anchor person's asking questions, the person that's answering the question, look where their eyes go. A lot of times they'll, they'll go up for, for, to remember, so visual. And then once you notice it, you'll see like, wow, that is so obvious once you do it. And this is all about trying to build rapport. Obvious to what though, Gino? Well, I mean, it's obvious when you look up to the right, you're, you're asking a question and you're either trying to remember it or if I say a pink you're elephant, processing, right? Yeah, you don't know a pink elephant, so you're trying to see what a pink elephant looks like. So you don't have that memory. And That's you're me to... all the time, <laughs> all the time. Yeah. So I mean, John, you can go through that. You can you go through what what, yeah, that, yeah, what sure. happens with a person's eyes. It's really important because I want everyone, as you're doing this, the next time you watch a YouTube video or you watch somebody asking questions, see what happens with their eyes and try to figure out what they are, whether they're visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. It'll give you an it'll give you an indication anyway, but what it what it does is it tells you how they're accessing their brain. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, here's what happens. I'm gonna give you the give you the quick and low down. Behind your eyeball are muscles holding your eyeball. Because your eyes move, okay, there are nerve endings in between all these muscles. Depending on where and how your eyes move, it lights up that particular cortex of your brain, is what happens. Mm-hmm. Now, doesn't mean you're always gonna be making pictures if you access visually. That's how you access the information at that moment. So, and then what people will do when, let's say, let's say you wanted to tell somebody about it, you want to describe a building, you, you got first, whatever you described it, you watch them. If they're, if they're going like this and they're making the pictures like this and they're looking up and going back and forth a little bit, like, because they're filling in data that they don't have. Mm-hmm. If you, if you access normally wired, I don't like the word normally wired. Mm-hmm. If you're normally wired and let's say right-handed in order, when you're going to remember visual information or even auditory information, your eyes are going to go to your left. Okay. If you're going to create or construct information, you're going to look to your right. Mm -hmm. So if I said to you here, just imagine this building, you're going to already start one. You're going to imagine a building. You don't even know what it's going to look like yet until you access something in your brain that for you represents a building. And then I'm going to say, but imagine what it looks like on this side. You got this on that side, you got that. And then you are going to start to construct that image, but you've got to light up that part of your brain in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So your eyes are going to do that back and forth, back and forth while you're constructing something you haven't seen before, but you're going on my explanation of what it looks like. If you haven't seen it yet, you do the same thing auditorily. You know, if I said to you, what does your car horn sound like? What, what, what would your car horn sound like? It would sound like a donkey. You know, you're going to first remember your car horn. Then you're going to go over to the other side with your eyes and construct it to sound like a donkey. So you could tell me what it would sound like as a donkey. It's how your brain yeah. works. <laughs> and this is so, all important everybody because this is trying to build rapport with the person trying to you speak their language it's not the golden rule it's do unto others as they want done unto them that's the platinum point. rule that's what we're trying to assume here and john i was at the seminar over the weekend and i love the story you did about rapport building you had a uh, a manager who was just a I don't, for lack of a better word, a jerk, a prick. And he was really throwing stuff at the guy when he was coming into his office. And basically everyone thinks of building rapport as in trying to be nice when you're building rapport. Can you share that story when the guy just came back in and said, you know what? And I think this is important for everybody trying to build rapport, mirror match and bring in this VAK, the visual auditory kinesthetic and how to use it in, in a business setting. Yeah. I tell people the following thing. Everybody thinks rapport is about being nice to somebody. It's not about being nice. It's nice to be nice. Mm-hmm. It's all about being the same as the other person as best you can by demonstrating some behaviors back to them. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the ones, the one I told about that in the, in the, in the, in the program was this guy was just in that when, first of all, he's in the shipping business, you know, we're talking about shipping containers and stuff on the docks mm-hmm. and he would, he didn't, he just throw things at this guy. Uh, I was working with uh, Mayor Sealand at the time, just to just give people a little background. I was, I was a consultant to them. And uh, his boss kept saying, go in and get this guy. Come on, I want to get him as a customer. I want to get him as a customer. And my first response usually is, tell your boss to go in and do it with you so you, the boss can teach you how to do it since he thinks he can do it. You know, I'm a, I'm a real proponent of that. That shuts the boss up for a while. That's why I do it. I don't think the boss knows how to do it. Matter of fact, I can bet on it. <laughs> so I told the guy, he's, and he says, I don't know what else to do. I said, okay, next time. I said, next time. But first of all, he's already done it enough times in this case. So he didn't have to wait till the next time. I said, go to his office. 
walk in as well, bang on a door if it's, if it's closed, bang on the door and open it yourself. Don't even wait for them to welcome you in. And just walk up to them and say, you know what? I've thought about this for a while. You know, you're just an asshole. You're the kind of person I don't want to do fucking business with. So go screw yourself. Okay. Thank you so much. You won't see me again. Screw you and walk out. And he said, what do you think is going to happen? I said, well, I only know one or two things are going to happen. First, tell your boss you're going to do this. So he can tell you don't to do that, not to do this. If he says, don't do this, then you say, then you go in and do it. Two, I said, tell your boss what you're going to do. Because the guy's going to do one of two things. He's either going to call, he's either going to call you back, he's either going to call your boss and say, hey, your guy was just here and, and was nasty to me. And which you go, yeah, I told you, boss. What are you, what are you, what are you asking me about this for? The second thing is, or he's going to call you up. You're going to call your cell phone and tell you to come on back. So why would he do that? It's because you're acting like an asshole, just like him. There's a certain thing where people get it. It goes like this, okay? It when they really know, work. Yeah. I've, listen, I've seen this a few more than more than this twice or crazy, three times man. or four times. No joke. Listen, he's not a customer. He, he's not a customer. Lose, right? Except for your reputation. You got, nothing, you, got to, you got nothing to lose. But here's the thing, you see, because you guys are from the Northeast, right? Mm -hmm. We are. But, but they, don't te they, they, don't, they don't teach us this, okay? When the other person knows that you know that they know what they're doing, Games are over. They stopped playing. Mm -hmm. Very simple. So that's what happened. He did that, went out, walked out of the thing, left, went out in the parking lot. His cell phone rang. I said, right, come on back in. Let's talk. And he said, okay, I'll listen, I'll give you a couple of containers. We'll try it out. Let's see how it works. He wasn't a customer. You're not getting him anyway. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the, what's the, where's the loss? And there's plenty of customers out there. Mm -hmm. So I know somebody did this on, did this on an airplane. Okay. Did it on an airplane. I don't, I don't know if you want to be acting crazy on an airplane these days. <laughs> not not no, nowadays. This was not, but... this, this was not these days. This was in the eighties, <laughs> <80s. laughs> and uh, this this happened. This happened to be a girl, and she missed almost missed her flight. The doors closing. She sticks her foot in the door. The flight attendant, what are you doing? She goes, I'm I'm on this flight. She goes, I don't think so. It's all sold out. She goes, Well, I'm I'm late. I mean, I was I was actually having a drink with her cousin or something like that in the bar, and the lady says, No, everything's full. She goes, No, I'm telling you, there's an empty seat on the plane. I know there's one. How she knew that, I don't know. Okay, but I do know who the person is. She's, she's kind of close to me, actually. So I know that she knows things for some reason. So you get on a plane, there's an empty seat. Okay. And, my, and, and, and she says, see that? There's an empty seat. The guy sitting next to the seat says, it's not empty. I bought the seat because I don't want anybody sitting next to me. What so, happened when the person came back from the bathroom? What's that? <laughs> I said, what happened when the person came back from the bathroom? <laughs> So, well, you're so, already up so, in the sky. Just sit on the floor. We'll get through it. So, so, so she's on a plane and, and the flight attendant saying, oh, yeah. And he goes, no, it's not empty. She goes, oh, please, can she have the seat? No, I don't want anybody next to me. I'll pay for it. I'll pay double for it. She wanted to get on. She was going to Hawaii. And, and he says, no, I don't want anybody. I don't want anybody sitting here. Sorry, I bought the seat. It's my seat, okay? And the flight attendant looks at the girl and says, listen, you got to get off the plane. She goes, okay. And she turned around. She did the same thing to the guy. You know what? You're an asshole. You know what? I don't, you wouldn't even have to buy that seat. Anybody who knows you wouldn't want to sit back and wouldn't want to ever sit next to you because you're a jerk. She turns around, she's walking out, you know, starting to walk up the aisle, get off the plane. And the guy says, all right, hold on a second. And he calls her back. He says, all right, sit down. And the girl says, no, no, I don't want to sit next to you now. And he goes, please. It's not joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> He's doubling down. I would, if I was her, I would have said like, okay, good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't push now, my luck. Now, <laughs> now, some of your people are probably going to sit there and go, ah, oh, this guy's full of shit. I mean, really, he's going to, this guy's, this guy's full of stories. Hey, it makes yeah, for a spicy I, life if you do these kind of things, right? I am, I am full of stories, but you know what? I got no reason to BS about them. None, none whatsoever. And um, it does, it does make a lot of sense though, because you are mirroring that other person. That other person has issues and you're speaking their language. And, and it really, I mean, I wouldn't do this on a high power negotiation, but if you've got nothing to lose, that wasn't her seat. She ain't getting it anyway. And the gentleman in the, in the sales office, he's not getting that gig anyway. So what do you have to lose? If you tell your boss, you're covering yeah. and your boss doesn't want to go in there and get something thrown at him as well. So it's really they a low barrier how. right there. That's you know, right. they don't know how. And it's not like you got And there's another thing about this, by the way, if the guy, if the other guy gets angry, you don't have to be angry. Mm -hmm. You just have to demonstrate the behaviors inside. You can be laughing mm -hmm. inside your head. Mm -hmm. We teach people, listen, don't just go in there and get, and get angry. You'll lose it. I mean, you can lose, you know, you can lose the whole thing freely. Mm -hmm. how, how often will it work? I have no idea. I've done it myself a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you label these people that uh, that respond to that? What what type of learner are they? Pricks? I, I don't I don't categorize them. I don't. I don't <laughs> this label is where them. I'm looking. Yeah, I'm looking for like to put this stuff in buckets to understand it. You're like, <laughs> that's, that's, no, that's, you just got to learn the Jedi way, brother. It ain't happening like <laughs> that. We don't, we don't we don't do the you're a sheep, bull, lamb, you know, dog, chicken, all that. We don't do yeah, that. Yeah, I want I want you to I want you to you know put them in boxes and then tell me uh, you know tell me what you know about each one of them. So you want to you know why we don't do that? Because you're gonna go inside your head. 
and try to figure out where they should belong, what bucket they belong in. And as soon as you go inside your head, you're going to miss the most important piece of information they're giving away. Mm -hmm. Wow. He's saying live be, within the ether, man. You got to be out here. Flow. You got to be present all the time, man. You can't, you know, you can't go in here and start to try to figure something out. And go Mamba mentality on him. John, what are the best types of questions? We had done this as well. The what, who, how, where, and when. Let's describe all of them. Let's tell listeners why they're great questions and why you need to use those questions. Those are the simple questions. The most simple questions. They teach us this in grammar school, probably first grade. You know, they're content questions. What, who, when, where, how, you know? And I always leave the why part off of that, off that list for a reason. And it's not because why is a bad thing to ask. It's actually one of the better questions you can ask, but you've got to put it in a context. If you don't put it into a context, you're going to be spinning around in circles with the person. You probably have kids. If you have kids, you, you understand this. You know, why did you do that? Because I wanted to. Why did you want to? Because I felt like it. Why did you feel like it? You know, because, because it seemed like it was a good thing to do. Why did you think it was a good thing to do? Because I did. Because I did. You know, you're going to get in a loop. Mm -hmm. But if you put it in a context, so, so if I say, I'm going to elicit data from you. If I'm going to, if I'm going to go in and do a, I'm going to go back to doing a deal to sale, whatever it is, because it makes it easier to explain it to people. People say, I ask them who likes to ask why, because I want to, I want to always relate it back to their own personage. Why do you like, who likes to ask why? Well, I like this. Why do you like to ask why? Well, I don't know, because I get, I get information. I go, do you really? And they go, no, and you don't get any information that you can utilize mm -hmm. and you're going to spin around in circles. You're going to get in a loop. Let me ask you this question. When you ask that why question, what do you really want to know? I get an answer. They might say, oh, I want to know what motivates them. I go, then ask that question. What motivates you to blah, 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 yak, 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 dot, dot, dot. You'll get better information. Okay? You can always use the why thing because why does elicit motivation. But most people are going to tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell you what it is because they know you know how to use it back on them. So they're going to make up some answer. Worse yet, they'll say, I don't know, which is bull. I like ask closed-ended direct questions? Open-ended. Well, Hold I do on. this thing. I, I do this thing, okay? I like to elicit data. I teach people to elicit information. Take your PowerPoint thing and leave it home because you don't even know how you want to present the information to these people or this person. You just don't know yet. You got to tailor taking, it as you go. You're taking a guess. You, what do you need PowerPoint for? Yeah. You got to get them feeling really good. Okay, time and money are the two biggest excuses and both of them we made up. We made up money. We made up time. Now, I'll go around and ask, ask people in the class. I do this all the time. I say, think about something. You were going to buy something, big ticket item, and you only were going to spend X. How many of you spent more than X? And they go, oh, I did. And we're talking about a house, a car. We're talking big ticket items for the normal consumer. Mm -hmm. I go, so what did you do? They go, how come you spent more? They go, well, I liked it. That's an emotion. That's a feeling. You're not selling words. You're not selling, you're not selling all the, va the value things that you think you're selling. People are connected to a feeling. The problem is they're your words, not the person's necessarily. So you got to listen real carefully. So what you might say is um, a fantastic deal and you feel good about that. Someone else might even think that's a good word for them. You got to find out what gets them going. So you, they might say what, what's, what gets me going is, is a, you know, um, let's say a, a, a deal that I can depend on. So that's what you want to be able to use back to them because that's going to have them feel good. You can depend on this deal and they're going to start feeling really good about it. But you say it's a fantastic deal might not even affect them at all, but you don't know that because you want to look in the bucket. There's nothing in the bucket that's that's useful. And John, think, this is go ahead, self feelings. No, self -feelings. Gonna, that, but that's that's the point that I was going to make because it seems to me that all the major news outlets simply are driven. Like, they seem to be using this because there's nothing. I'm going to choose my words carefully here. Yeah. It all seems to be emotion driven, though. <laughs> no, but it does. It seems everything that I, I you know, I, I go out and I, I jump around all these different sites okay. because you know one's well if, yeah no but I, I'm, I'm trying to get a broad you know grouping of information here so i want to hear what this guy's saying i want to hear what this guy's saying and it all seems to be trying to elicit an emotional response it seems to be devoid of facts and important things and filled with how can i get this you know person that's consuming this to give an emotional reaction to do something potentially yeah, sure <laughs> they're driven they're, they are driven to deliver bad news i don't know why is One it because little, it gets a higher emotional response and, and pulls people in or? It's a, it's a lot. Listen, nobody wants to hear about the, 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 the nice little puppy that was found who was lost for two days. Yeah. They're not interested. They're just not interested. Mm -hmm. So they're going to deliver bad news, bad news, bad news. Fear, fear can drive people into very different places, very different directions. Fear. Mm -hmm. So the media, as far as I'm concerned, is basically useless. I, I read something. I, I like to read I wouldn't say that, it's useless. They have a use. It, it may not be ethical and, and you know. It's useless in, to me. It's yeah, but, it, me. but it's, it may not be there for what it's, it's you know, uh, stating to do. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's tools at play here. Most news is not news at editorials. Yeah, yeah, so, that's fair. You know, people that. don't know, and people don't people don't know the difference. This is important. Difference. This is important, everybody, because at, no. at the uh, at the event the past weekend, John talked about crucial to anyone who has a business or is trying to sell something. The dominant buying motive. Let's talk about that because those are words, needs, wants, and would like. And let's discuss that that pie that that circle you drew made us draw and and break it down because this is very important everybody this is if you're selling a product or even if you're going out there and talking to somebody you know those needs are important you have to listen can we go into that real quick john yeah sure there's thing i'm gonna i'm gonna for the for, for the normal consumer i'm gonna call them motivator words mm -hmm. okay in uh in our technology we call them they're they're, they're called uh, modal operators what they do is they qualify verbs mm -hmm. i want to give the grammar lessons on people but <clears throat> this is what happens so here's a problem. You have needs, wants, and like to have. Those are the, those are the three big ones. So if, if you're going to be selling, you know, home, let's say you're going to sell homes and someone comes in and, they, and you say to them, hi, what can I do for you today? Okay. They're going to say, I'm interested in the home. And the next question would be, I know I've different, different questions for, for starters. How much time do you have? I always want to know how much time they have. Mm -hmm. Most people will tell you, don't ask that question. I go, well, ask that question because they have a time limit. You'll know, if you don't ask that question, within a few minutes, they're going to look at their watch. That's a rapport breaker. They're telling you I've had enough, basically. They want to see, oh, and they're coming up with the next excuse. I got another meeting. I got to run. I ask them right up front, how much time do you have to spend with me today? And then I honor that time. That's important. If they say, I got 20 minutes. I go, great. Up to 20 minutes. At the end of the 20 minutes, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to say, listen, you said you had 20 minutes. Do you want to stop here? Should we continue? Mm -hmm. If you've lit their candles enough, they're going to say, let's continue. Because that time thing is a bunch of bull mm -hmm. most of the time. So... Now you're going to say, so let me ask you this question. And this gets a little picky now. What do you want or what's important to you in the new home? What do you want? When you ask that want question, because that's, that's, that's a qualifier. They're going to say, I want this. I need, or they're going to bring you need. I need this. I want this. I like to have that. Those are three things that are important. And there's other ones, by the way. I don't want this. I don't want that. I log those in my brain because there's things they don't want. I might have to use that in order to motivate them to go in the other direction to get what, what I want them to get because mm -hmm. okay? they do want things, but sometimes because we're human and we're, we're raised not to talk about what we want. Except when someone says to you at Christmas time, what do you want for Christmas? I mean, otherwise, if and you my say, my son hey, is the complete opposite of that. He tells me every day about four things he, sees that he wants. So that's, I, I, I got to keep them that way, I guess. Well, 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 you know that, you know, they learn from their parents. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> Well, kids model their parents. So mm -hmm. but anyway, so so then they're going to tell you. So I'm going to give you my example. I use a simple example. I, I don't know if I'm, 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 I mentioned at the seminar. OK, mm -hmm. but in order to qualify what I've done, so people talk, maybe this guy's not full of crap all the way. Maybe he's just only half full of crap. I consulted and did sales training for Ryland Homes okay, down in Maryland at their, at their headquarters. And I did that probably for about four, maybe three, four, I forget, three, four or five years in the early 90s okay, because they wanted to increase their sales course. So here's what happens. I don't know why this happens, but if, if you start to say to people, what do you need in your new home? I say, don't ever ask what they need because everything will come out as a need. You've lost your negotiation skills. You, your power to negotiate, it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's off the table because for the most part, needs are not negotiable. I need to breathe. I need air. I need, I need water. I need food, right? They say, I need three bedrooms. I need two full baths. I need a living room. I need a fit. You're done. You're, you're done. You better have all of that. If you don't have all of that, you're in trouble because now you've, you've actually primed their brain. You put you yourself put in a, a box. Yeah. Oh, big box. You can't, you're not getting out. It's, it's, you can get out. I'm not saying you can't get out, but it's, it's more difficult. You're making, it, you're making it harder on yourself. Mm -hmm. As opposed to listening to them. Because most people are going to tell you, one, what the negotiation, not negotiate. I need three bedrooms. They want two full bathrooms. One upstairs, one downstairs. I want a large family room. I want a large living room. Oh, and I like to have a fireplace in the outside patio deck. I mean, that's that's an easy example I use just so people understand. So you got needs, you got wants, you got like to have. Now, when you repeat things back to them, and I got to tell you, the, my 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 favorite thing to tell salespeople: stop paraphrasing. It's an insult to the other person. The person says to you, "I need three bedrooms." You don't say, "Okay, let me see if I got this right." When you, when you go back and recap, recap for them, you got to recap for them. Call it parrot phrasing, not paraphrasing. You don't say, okay, so you need three places for people to sleep. The brain's not lit. It's lit up for, I need three bedrooms. Mm -hmm. You basically say back to them, let me see if I got this right. You need three bedrooms. You want two full baths, one upstairs, one downstairs. You also want a large family room and a large living room. 
And you also like to have a fireplace in the outside patio deck. Repeat that back, the words and the criteria. That, you Why? Know, the, the, because their brain is already lit, okay, for those things. If you start to change the words, okay? No, but why do you repeat it back? I guess I'm not following. Oh, no, because, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because part of rapport, part of rapport, most important part first is to demonstrate understanding. Got it. Okay. You don't demonstrate understanding by changing the words around from your point of view, because you're insulting the person. You're basically saying, okay, so you didn't say, I walked off of a car lot. I told this story. I had a, I, my wife and I was early, it was in the 80s. I went on a Toyota lot. I'll never go on a Toyota lot again, by the way. Never. I'll never walk into a Toyota dealership because of this. Not that everybody would do this from Toyota, but it, it just it got me pissed off. Hot summer day, steamy, all this crap. I see this car and I go, and no prices on it. It was a summer, it was a big sale. And the sales guy says, can I help you? I said, yeah, how much is this Cressida? And he goes, it's called a Cressida. And I said, no kidding. And what do you call this? And walked off the lot. And walked that's off a middle the finger lot. for the folks that are listening. And he walked, and he walked off. The, that's the New Jersey hello thing. And I walked, we walked off the lot. You criticize a customer like this, you could have sold a car. I was going to buy the damn car. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how much the car was, but I said the wrong name. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, you guys know what it's like. It's like one night, you know, you get into a crazy thing like that, and you call your wife an old girlfriend's name. You're cooked. You're done. <laughs> you're finished. You're mm -hmm. finished. So, so you repeat it back. That demonstrates understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're watching news, okay, and I'm not, a, I'm not a. Well, I'm not, I am highly political, but I don't, I don't favor certain news stations. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the ones that have followed some of our things because I hear what they're doing. So if you say, now you said to me, well, why would I repeat everything back? Normally I would say to you, the reason I would repeat everything back is for this reason. I would repeat your question back as a statement back to you first, because that's for lack of a better term, that synaptic trail is already hot, man. It's it's waiting. So what if trail? I want to change synaptic, synaptic, synaptic trail, you're, you're, See, I'm putting you're, it you're, back you're, on him now, Gene. I'm putting it back yeah, on yeah, yeah, the yeah. synaptic trail. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's what's warm. That's what's lit up. You're, that part of you, you know, that one thing, that little trail in your brain is lit. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then there's some very few one or two stations actually that have taught the people, every single person that they interview is coached first to repeat the question back. So when the interviewer asks them a question, they start their answer with that question and repeat it back as a statement and then give the answer to the question. I'm going to say safely without doing all the non-research I've never really done, non-scientific research, 99% of the time. So if somebody's listening in and, and coaching somebody and the other people don't really care. The news, news people, they're not doing this. Mm -hmm. So... So which one? You, you, you don't don't leave us hanging here. We need to meet. Who's doing this? Be interested in something. Come on. <laughs> oh man, he wants us coming back for more. He just told us to f <laughs> off and left the room. Now he's like, "Call me back. Call me back." <laughs> oh, you want to know what station it is? Yeah, of course. Sure, it's Fox. So they are yeah. in the ways of the Jedi right now. You're saying Fox? They've been in it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I only and, know. And who was that? Was that a thing led up by Murdoch, or uh, where'd that come from? Where they learn to do that? No, no. Who led that initiative? Do you know? I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea. I know a couple. And I know a couple of the contributors, you know. And I've and I've I've scouted. I've scouted. Listened. Watched other other news channels, and they're not doing it. You know, they're not doing it. I love that. So let's get into the five steps of persuasion go before we go into the short go answers. Ahead. Five steps. Let's get into it. Get attention. Establish rapport. Package the friso. Objection block. And close in future pace. Let's get into those because this is important for for investors. Sure. sure. You've always got to get their attention first, or you're wasting your time. You know. And uh, there's a lot of different ways of getting attention. I mean, lots of different ways. I mean, you really got to captivate them at first. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about, you know, this is for this for like, you know, calling people, soliciting, whatever it is. What's your line that's going to get me interested? Mm -hmm. What's your line? You got to, you're going to call investors perhaps, right? Because you got a hot deal. What are you going to tell them? I got a hot deal for you. They might or might not be interested. They're going to say, what do you mean a hot deal? What do you got? And then you got to start explaining stuff, but you haven't told them what you can do for them. Mm -hmm. So to me, the opener is, Okay. And remember, sales goes, this goes two ways. Are you coming to me or am I going to you? If I'm going to you, I got a different job to do. If you're coming to me, it ought to be easy. You're not walking into a car dealership to buy apples. Mm -hmm. Just not. Okay. And I, this, this one cracks me up going into car dealerships because you're not going in to buy apples. It's very simple. When they say to you, what can I do for you? That's a good question. Sometimes they don't even know what to ask. They just don't. Mm -hmm. So I've given, I've given car dealers criteria. I go, here's what I want. I want this, this, this. I've had, deal, I've had salespeople in car dealerships say, that's not what you want. 
what are you stupid? I mean, that's not what I want. I had, I had one guy say to me one time, I said, the, the car I want is right out of the parking lot. You have the color I want, everything. I just, I want, all I need is two things. One's the keys to the car. I got to make sure my wife can see over the steering wheel. Two, best price. Come on, I'm not going to fool around with you, all right? And I had a person say to me, I'm, that one out there? I said, yeah. They said, that car's not you. So call me stupid because I don't know what the car that I want is, right? <laughs> So, and I go with the language, by the way, Jake, I go with the language first, Jake. So I look, I look at the car I look at me. I look at the car. I look at the sales person. I go, you're right. The car is not me. The car is the car. And I'm me right here. You know, you've been in any fights on the, uh, in the car lots before <laughs> yeah, you get physical with anybody. No, 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 no. No, but you got it. I'm this customer for crying out loud. I don't want to uh, buy a car. I completely I, agree with you. I get it. If I, I walk I into your it. car dealership and you want to talk me out of buying a car, I'm telling you I want to buy that car. No questions asked except for the price. We're going to argue with the price. Yeah. Then you're crazy. That guy should be no. fired. He should yeah. fire his ass in the spot, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so again, you know, so you got to get their attention if you're, if you're going to do the, you know, you want to get their attention basically. Um, my question to them is, is I, I learned this from a guy who called me one time. Um, as, as an opener line, because it's always going to have an opener line to get your foot in the door. And I tell people, listen, a lot of times, depending on what you're doing, you want to get a face-to-face -face meeting. You don't want to do this telephone thing because they can hang up very easily. It's much more difficult for them to tell you to get out of their office. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do that so easily. Not only that, you can see them, you can watch them. You can see when they're getting a little bit, I don't know about, you know, you, you, can, you know they're not going for this. And you can ask other questions. You can back up, step sideways and go another direction. It's hard to do that on the phone. Mm -hmm. Was the guy calls me up and the first line out of his mouth. And I was annoyed first because this was my private consulting line. And I don't know how he got the number, but I was a little bit annoyed first. And he knew my name. So this wasn't a robocall kind of thing that he got. Yeah, he was doing his research, you know, he was, he was prepared. Yeah. So listen, I, appreci I appreciated that. Yeah. So I, was, I, was, I was a little annoyed because it was my private consulting line because that, I, would give that, I would give that to you guys, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so he says, hi, he says, this is so and so, is this John LaBelle? I said, yeah, it is. And uh, before I could say to him, where'd you get my number from? You know, he said, I can make you lots of money. And my response to him was, keep talking. I want to find out how far this guy's going to go. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn a few more things, maybe. Because I thought that's a good opener. Because I'm not staying on a phone with people who call me and want to sell me anything. <laughs> He's I can make you lots of money. I said, keep talking. And he started talking. And he got to point by three or four sentences. And I went, no, nope, this isn't for me. And I told him this. I said, oh, you know what? Let me stop you right there. I'm not, this is not, but I wanted to find out some more from him. Mm -hmm. so I start throwing different objections at him. Okay. Very simple ones. I said, I don't have the money right now to make it. He was selling investments. I said, I don't have the money to make any investments. And he goes, well, you know, we could put it on credit card. And I said, yeah, I get those back in about, I think six or eight months. And he says, well, okay, well, you know, do, do you have any other income coming in? You have anything like coming in in the future, like you're working and stuff? I said, not, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole year has been kind of crap, actually. This was about the nineties again. This whole year has been kind of crap. I said, but you know what? My grandma, she's not doing too good. And she told me once that I'm her favorite grandson and she's going to leave me all her money. And the doctor said, by the way, she's not looking good right now. She might be gone in a few weeks. And he's okay. Thank you so much. And he hangs up. This guy calls me back a couple of months later and asked the next question. Are you ready for no. the low John? No. Oh yeah. And he actually very, very just, Hey, hello, John. I go, yeah. He goes, is your grandmother dead yet? Oh. <laughs> And I said, actually, she had a, a miraculous recovery. The doctor's amazing. She has no, no idea what happened. She says she probably got another five to 10 years. So, so I wanted to know more about that. So, so the report thing is important. Mm -hmm. You know, what can you do for me? Okay. And the, remember, the report part is about demonstrating understanding. Mm -hmm. Then, what well, was next? Oh, presenting information. But you got to collect data to get information. Uh -huh. you know, how, I mean, you got you to ask all the right questions. I've always, I'm going to answer your question from earlier, Jake. You asked about closed questions, open all these things. I use, I go with the general rule of law, okay? And uh, general rule of law and letter of the law as a way of knowing how to ask questions. So you're not allowed to ask compound questions in the courtroom. I mean, you can, they do it all the time. So I ask open-ended questions. I do not ask yes, no questions unless I know the answer is obviously going to be yes. Mm -hmm. If I don't know the answer is going to be yes, I don't ask the question. Because I don't want to teach them how easy it is to say no to me. That's what you're doing. Every time they go, no, 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 no. Man, you're making it easy to say, to say no. That's it. Start to you're get weird at that point. Sorry? No, it'll start to get weird at that point, too. And then, and then they, they almost have this possessive high ground on you if you're, if you're trying to sell somebody something. It's weird. Yeah, so, I, so I ask. When, I, when my son was little, he said, Daddy, can I go out and play? Finish your homework? 
That was my question back. I never said yes or no. <laughs> finish your homework. That was the yes, no question. I go, you finish your homework. I didn't answer the yes, no, can you go out and play? That was my stopper for him. So you got to gather the information. You got to get the information back. Then you got to do the conditional close thing. When you do the conditional close thing, you've got to repeat back the information. Basically, not every word for word, but those modal operators, those motivator words. Okay, let me give, let me give you a demonstration. I'm going to back to the motivator words for a second. But I think you'll appreciate this one. So I'm your boss. Okay, so actually, if you, if you said to yourself the following, the following statements, I'm going to give you a diff, the same statement but with a different operator, okay? If you said, I wish I could take off from work Friday, was that feeling strong enough for you to want to take off from work? Not really. I wish, no, not wish, really. Wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. Right? I'd like to take off from work Friday. You're going to take off? A little more direct, but right. not really. That goes with a feeling, mm -hmm. okay? I want to take off from work Friday. You're getting there. Okay, I need to take I off. I still from don't work hear Friday. you yet. You get warmer. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. I need to take off from work Friday. Yeah. Now I tell me it. why. No, tell me why. Like something's going on, and I got to get this day off. Now we're now we're driving some emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you just gave it away to me. Now say this to yourself. Say this one to yourself. I got to take off from work Friday. Yeah. You gone? I got to take off from work Friday. My kids got a baseball it, game. You gave it to me. I don't even have to ask for it. You gave yeah. it away. Yeah. You said, well, what if I said I got to take it? I said, go ahead and say it. You're giving it away. Mm -hmm. All I got to do is be, be here and present and listen to you. Mm -hmm. Now, you can go all the way down to I will, all these things. Okay? I will, I'm going to, and they all mean something different in the brain and, and how, they're gonna, how, you're gonna, how it's going to end up with certain feelings. Remember, the end of the strategy is going to be a good feeling. Now, I'm telling you, it's got to be good enough, depending on that modal operator that you would use. Mm -hmm. Now, what I just did for you was I gave you to go, internal your own internal motivation now just because someone uses those words doesn't mean you can use those words back not that easy mm -hmm. it's easy to do it doesn't mean it's going to work but now i say to you i'm your boss okay, i'm your i'm your new big boss okay you gotta have now, you in the field that day i need you there <laughs> i was a pretty good boss by the way right and i could say to you hey, listen you know you guys got to do a report for me at the end of the week i'd like to do that you know, i need the report to give to my boss and so you know what I wish you'd give me a report some Mondays. When am I getting them? You're not getting a Monday. <laughs> I need to get a Monday. You know what? Jake, Jake, I'd like to get my reports on Mondays. I don't think he said anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I'd I want like Monday. a million bucks too, pal, but it ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> I want my reports on Mondays. Ooh, I think you might be a little it. more serious. Yeah. Maybe. Right, right, right. Okay. And I can run right down. I need my reports on Mondays. And your internal response is probably going to be, hey, LaValle, you need the reports, you do the reports. I mean, they're all going to mean something different because they're externally imposed. Mm -hmm. so you got to be careful. You can always repeat back to the customer what they want, need, like to have How much all emotion those. are you driving? Here's, here's one thing. How I much do you want? With. Yeah. How much well, do you want to drive? Well, here's, here's one thing just when it comes to team members, you know, folks on your team. We mm -hmm. recently, you know, got somebody on board because his prior employer, he had something set up. He had to. I got it to get this day off. They won't grant it to him. He left high emotions, not worth it. If you have a great team member and they need something like that, and they're telling you that, and there's emotion behind it, find a way to work it out. You're not exactly. solving anything by taking a great team member and then pushing back just because there's always more days. There's more things. Look, I'm not saying if they're not good and then they're doing these things, that's a different story. If you have a great team member and they need the day off and there's high emotion behind it, why are you going to battle? You're going to take a sword to that person and, and try to exactly because they're just going to it's you're going to get high emotion back. It ain't worth it. It just just higher level thinking, right? Yeah. Well, when I was up in I just moved down to Florida last summer, so but when I was up in Jersey, I it's went part of the migration, you know. I know. I thought I'd join the rest of them. You know. Was there a caravan uh, or what? <laughs> <laughs> I went to my bank because I was working on some things for a company I was working for. I was doing a little bit of motivation research kind of thing. I went into my bank and I asked the tellers. OK, one at a time, I said to them, what would I if I'm your boss in the bank here, what would I have to do in order to want, have you want to come to work Monday morning? What would, I, what would I have to do as a boss? And they all said almost the same thing. They said, you just did it. I said, what's that? They go, you asked me for my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, this is really easy. I said, what if I don't? I mean, I'm going to listen. But what if I don't do what you what you want me to do? Recommend me. They go right at this point. It doesn't matter. You actually asked me. You asked me what I think. I thought, this is too cool. You know, this is going to be a problem now with the future generations coming up because they don't even know what they want. Mm -hmm. Except for they, they want a voice. So, Jake, before we go to the short answers, I got to ask 
John about the word should, because it's a really powerful word. And, and, and that word should, what happens when we use the word should either internally or you hear it? Well, the word should is very, very interesting word because we're raised when we're, when we're brought up. Okay. We're told to not, we're saying you should not do that, or you should do this. You should do this. You should do that because that's what someone else wants us to do. Mm-hmm. And it's usually something we really want to be doing. Who knows what it is, but we, we polarize to that word. You should eat your broccoli. Exactly. Exactly. I tell people this. I go, listen, this is how it works. All right. Very simple. Um, and by the way, I ask people, do you do what you should do? How, how many people like to tell people what they should do or they tell people what they should do? I got a bunch of hands above. I go, do you do what you should do? Most of them go, no. Well, how could you ask somebody to do something that you think they should do? You say you should do this and you don't do it. You got to be kidding me. That's crazy. You know, and people understand this. So, so here's what happens. Just so you understand the works. You go to the refrigerator. You open the refrigerator. Here's your clear set of choices, celery or cheesecake. You look at the celery and you say to yourself, the celery. Then your eyes aren't, you know, you st- your stomach's not ready yet. So your eyes start scanning the fridge. You see the cheesecake and they pop out of your head. And you go, ooh, you shouldn't have that cheesecake. You black out from there. You grab, a <laughs> hunk, you, grab, you grab a hunk of cake, you eat it. When you eat it and it feels good, you actually think about it, not consciously necessarily, but you say, oh, man, oh, I shouldn't have had that cheesecake. You're so bad. So the word shouldn't gets associated to the good feeling. That's why you'd rather do things you shouldn't do than what you should do. Mm-hmm. Because the should word has a negative thing to it. If I got to the thing where you said, I got to take off Friday. And you said, wow, I'm doing it. Next thing I say to you, just to test it out, I go, you know what, Jake, you should take off to, you should take off from work Friday. And notice how you feel about it. Or better yet, say it to yourself. Not that I'm going to say Now it. you're really messing with your mind at a high level. <laughs> no, if you said to yourself, I should take off from work Friday, you're going to think, oh, Man, I better not do this. Oh, I thought so you said you were yeah. you're telling the team member they should. If they no, come to you and say, I got to have Friday off. And you said, you should take Friday off. They're going to go, <laughs> <laughs> who is this guy? If, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if their got to take off is so strong, your should's not going to matter. Mm. It's not. Really not going to matter. Love you're, you're, it's, a, it's a battle of the feelings, you know? I mean, that, that's, that's how it works. That's, but that word is really important. My wife, I, I, we, my wife, she does her should's. If she says out loud she should do something, she does it. I thought, cool, now I can motivate my wife, right? Wrong. So I, said, I said to her one time, honey, we should do this. And she gave me the face. I said, what's with the face? And she said, you just told me I have to do this. I said, no, I didn't. I said, you should. And she's like, no, you said have to. And I'm thinking, her listening ears aren't working. Well, depends Go on what they try do. Try to say that to her and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, don't be so emotional. Yeah, man, that works. <laughs> But you don't know what they do with the word. You don't know what they do with the words when they hear them. Mm-hmm. Because what do they do with the words when they hear them? I never know what's going on up there. Exactly. Your ears don't hear and your eyes don't see. They just collect the information and then it gets translated in your brain. Mm-hmm. So you're not, not really ever sure. So your eyes just collect the information. Your ears just collect the information. That's why you can have an argument about what I said. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, I didn't. If you haven't recorded, we can argue about it. Mm-hmm. So that's the way your brain works. All right, guys, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single-family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team. And I want to let you know, this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we are back. We uh, got some really, you know, some fun stories. There's folks out there saying this could be useful to me. NLP may be something that would benefit my business. What would be a starting point for them? 
Uh, the easiest thing would be yeah. easiest. I mean, listen, you can read books. You can go on YouTube, watch some videos. We don't want the shouttas. We don't want the shuttas. What do they need? They're going to whet your appetite. Yeah. If you want the full meal, go to a seminar. Go to, go to, go to a good seminar. You won't know it's good unless you know where you're going. There's too much NLP out there. It's been, been di- diluted. You know, it's, it's been around over 50 years now, actually. Wow. And the two co- yeah, the two co-developers are still there. Uh, I worked with Richard Bandler. He's one of the two guys. They can go to richardbandler.com, check the schedule out. They can go to Pure NLP. You know, that's my site. Check the schedule out. Um, and people are going to say, well, I don't know, man. I don't have the time or the money. Come to a teaser, man. Come to Persuasion Engineering. For if they don't have the time or money, they're not going to improve themselves anyway. So that's uh, that's a lost cause. Right? Those, are all, those are all BS answers yeah. anyhow. You know, mm-hmm. we made it up. I, I've proven it all time and time again with people. If you want it bad enough, you're going to do it. Yeah. You're going to make time to do it. But that's the best thing to do. Go, go, you know, go to, go to seminar because that's where you get a life. You get to work with other people at the seminar and try this stuff out. You know, that's what we just did persuasion. We just did another seminar. We got starting tomorrow. We're doing presentation skills, get people up on stage. First thing. Well, that, and that's where you and Gino met, correct? You guys yes. met. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Mm-hmm. yeah. He came to persuasion and uh, you know, so. He dad puts his money where his mouth is. All right. He it's always, it's always learner. about learning, Jake. I mean, it's always about improving yourself and it really is about trying to build rapport in the real estate business. And it's not just being nice, but trying to get those cues and trying to get those visuals. And even in presentation where you want to be a little visual, sometimes you want to be auditory sometimes, and you want to be kinesthetic and feely sometimes. So you're trying to use this in when you're speaking as well. So it doesn't only just work in negotiation, but in also when you're presenting information in, in whatever way, whether you're doing it on stage, whether you're doing it through a podcast, whether you're doing it live in front of somebody. Yeah. Instead of using one system or two systems or even jump, just use them all. Mm-hmm. You know, you keep cycling them around is what I tell people to do. You know, as you're watching me doing this, you're listening to what I'm saying. You're going to start to feel differently about the things you can actually start doing. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll see yourself behaving and doing different ways. You'll see yourself selling more things. You'll hear yourself speaking better with and listening better with the customers and clients. I'm going both ways with this, seeing them, hearing them, you know, speaking with them. And, uh, and you'll start feeling even more confidence on call. People, salespeople are very, sometimes, they're not confident, mm-hmm. and which is why they have trouble closing. They don't want to hear no. I said, and don't ask the yes, no question. Don't ask the customer what do they think. You really want to know what they think? No, I ask them this. I say, listen, when I want their opinion, I give it to them. I'm not interested, I'm not interested in poking and, prod- and prodding with more things I have to argue about. Mm-hmm. You, know, be, you, know, you know, discount this, knock that objection out. Um, and I believe in getting objections. If you're not getting objections or at least questions, something's wrong. If they're just sitting there like this listening, very passively, sort of, you're not, you're not there. Mm-hmm. You're not there. You know, in most cases, I got, I got to say, you're not, you're not there. They're, they're not ready. They're not doing anything. Uh, so I like to have the interaction. Uh, don't ask the yes, no questions for closing. So what do you think? I don't want to know what you think. I should know what you think by the time I get to the close. Mm-hmm. I've already done conditional closing. I've used those modal operators with the words you, you gave me, the criteria you gave me, I'm running around this thing I used to, I call the wheel, which are really different contexts in your business, different areas in your business that you really want to cover. Because they may not ask a question about something in that context. Mm-hmm. You might say, do you want to know anything about this? Are you interested? In, are you, is this important to you at all? And they might say, no, I don't care. That's okay. You covered it. They're not going to come back later and say, oh, you never told me about this part. I asked you about this part. You said you weren't interested. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't necessarily say it that way to them. But that's, that's what happens. You can, you can reduce the amount of buyer's remorse, basically. Yeah, no, I- we're always looking yeah. to move the needle as much as we can for folks. And yeah. our folks most times are raising money for large scale apartment deals. So they're, they're going yeah. out. And so, you know, I was, I had a question in mind about, you know, the biggest mistake you see salespeople making. And I just want to be clear, our folks are raising money. So there is a sales mm-hmm. component to that. Yep. So if someone's listening to this show right now, they may be, maybe they never have any sales experience at all, but they're now they're out there raising money for their apartment deal. What is, the biggest mistake or the most consistent mistake you see sales folks making that we may be able to give them self-awareness and correct that? Ooh. They, they don't ask the best questions they can. The biggest one. They just, they just don't ask the best questions that they can. Um, when, I was with, when I was doing the work for Ryland, they, uh, they would do the, the uh, what do they call it, secret chopper thing. And they'd video through a wall, okay, through a picture in a wall. And there was a guy asking these kind of questions, sales guy. He didn't know they were secret shoppers, of course, right? Um, so, so you're relocating here with the company. Uh, do, they, do you have a good retirement plan with the company? Did they have a good retirement plan? I was like, um, yeah, yeah, you know, that's, it's all right. You know, no. nonsensical stuff. Uh, uh, so you have children. Mm-hmm. Oh, how old are they? Well, oh, they're like 13, 14. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and he asked these crazy questions. I'm thinking, where does, where's this guy going? The, the, the shoppers, by the way, got so frustrated. 
they stepped out of what I would refer to as the circle of sell, you know, selling circle. When you're when you're engaging, and all of a sudden one of them steps back, you're not, and they've got their head down like this. They must be saying to themselves, "What the hell's this guy doing?" Mm-hmm. So we stopped the video thing, and I talked to him later, and I asked the guy. I said, "What were you doing? You were asking all these questions." Not that they were nonsensical. I couldn't tell where he was going with these questions. There's no plan or direction. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. He said, I was trying to find out how much of a mortgage payment they could afford. And I said, how about asking them? No shit. How much of, how much of a mortgage? How, much how do mortgage- I know if I'm Jewish? <laughs> yeah, right? Ask me. How much of a mortgage? I saw that on the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How much of a mortgage? Listen to what he said. He said to me, he said, he said, I said, why don't you ask him how much of a mortgage payment can you afford? He said, because they'll lie to me. I said, count on the fact that they're going to lie to you. And add another third on top of that. Mm-hmm. They say I can do a thousand. They take it to probably do fifteen hundred. Who knows? I don't know. But I'm but count on the fact they're not going to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. But at least ask them that question. Stop dancing around. They're dancing. You got to sell. The buyers are dancing around trying to figure out what the hell you're doing. Mm-hmm. So ask the question. You know what do you? What my question to the salespeople is: Ask the question about what do you really want to know from the client, from the customer? What do you really want to know? You have the money or you don't have the money? And you do, don't waste my time. I've got a guy did it. I saw my house in New Jersey, you know, to, to come down here. And the real estate guy, he was great. I got to tell you, he was great. We didn't hit it off the first time he came to my house. We did not hit it off because I was probably not anything. He told me at the end, you're nothing like any, any other customers I've ever had. He said, I teach this. What do you want me to do? I teach this. He goes, you know, I gave serious thought to not bothering to sell. You know, I, w- I didn't want to be your agent. I said, that would have been okay with me. I wouldn't have cared. He said, but you know why I changed my mind? I said, because you love me. He said, no, I love your wife. (laughs) She's great. (laughs) So I figured, let me hang in there. (laughs) But he was great. And he asked all the right kind of questions. You know, I've seen people go through my home, agents, looking to bring clients, customer, potential buyers. And they go, okay, so go look around. They let people run loose in my house. And they're sitting down by the door. They all do that too. It's so, it's so, yeah. Are they, this is, re, this is retail selling, you know, retail, right? And while they're on their phones, okay? And I'm thinking, I'm, I only noticed because I have cameras in my house, right? And uh, I was amazed, absolutely amazed, absolutely amazed. So this is important, guys. We talked about the dominant buyers buying motive. Create the dominant buying motive for your business. So if you're raising capital, what, is, what are you selling, basically? You're selling an IRR. You're selling a return. You're selling retirement. You're selling cash flow. You're selling apartments. Figure out what they are, what your plan is. Like John had talked about, if you're doing retail with the home, you're selling, you know, financing. Someone's you're selling- future life, right? They're building a future life of potential passive income. They're yes. so creating a life for themselves. Yeah. yeah what yes. you don't know, yeah, what you don't know is because I remember I said I got this wheel and, and all these different pieces of the pie. Mm-hmm. Now, if all, all the ones that are in that pie, there's something because it's important to them. You don't know how important, right? Need, want, like, whatever, yes. right? But you say it in the, that's when it's okay to ask the why question. So if you said to me, well, I want to make sure I get a good return on my investment. And I said to you, oh, okay. So you, so you said to me that you wanted to make sure this was a good return on your investment, didn't you? And they go, mm-hmm. yeah. I go, why is that important to you? Now I'm going to ask that why question, mm-hmm. put it in a context. And you're going to say, well, because I'm going to take the money from the investment. I'm going to put it aside. You say, I got kids. I got to send them to college someday. Go, okay, cool. I'm going to go to the next one. What was another one? Uh, you know? just safety. I, I want a okay. safe investment. I want to, and I want, okay. You also said you want to have a safe investment, mm-hmm. didn't you? And they said, yeah. I said, why is a safe investment? And we're still using those words back because it's lit up in here. Mm-hmm. Why is a safe investment important to you? And you go, listen, I can't afford to gamble away the money too badly. I got no, creamed I mean, in 08 in the stock market. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Well, no, I want to hedge against inflation. Yes. Yeah, but I'm still asking them a positive question. I'm saying, why, why is a safe investment important to you? Mm-hmm. They're going to say, because I can't afford to lose money because, they, listen, I got kids, man. I still want to send them to school. I'm mean, looking towards their future, too, blah, blah, blah. Kid. Mm-hmm. You could end up that the buying motive, dominant buying motive is the kids. It has nothing to do with the investment at all. It does, but not. You're going to sell it through that dominant buying motive. It could be the kids. You don't know. It could be, I want to keep my wife happy. Mm-hmm. You're going to sell that through the wife. Now, my wife's going to let me do, you play with this money, but, you know, she's got to be happy. Okay, so I have to stamp it, stamp it before it goes out the door. Or Jake, it could even be an investor saying, "Hey, I want to invest in multifamily. I want to show my friends that I've, I'm in apartments." I mean, a lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers want that, and you say to him, "Oh, all right, he wants to do it because he wants to be in his asset class. He can't do it himself because he or she is too busy." So 
that's why they want to do it. So maybe you can. That you is can... such a good point. You know, there's literally people that because multifamily is, is very hot right now, and they see people doing well in it. They want to be in the, the club like they want to be in apartments. That's mm -hmm. that's a real thing right now. There's a thing called social acceptance, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, especially among peers. You know, no, I want a Porsche because my friends have a Porsche. Boy, when they see me in my Porsche, they're going to say, wow. But that's got to be that dominant buying motive has to be a dominant buying motive. In yes. other words, it shares. They give the same answer enough times mm -hmm. to different parts in that wheel that you're asking about that that, that one that one motive is shared. So you've got to fish for that and and, uh, and teach you how to do it. Teach you how to share, how to how to find that. You've got to ask enough questions, and that's the one that's going to work. Boom. You know. Yes. You should bring us home. There's a lot to recap on this because I, I want to hammer back on the dominant. <laughs> I want to hammer back on this dominant buying motive because this is really important for everybody out there. You need to sit down and assess what your business is. If you're raising capital, if we're selling education, if you're doing property management, you're looking at what the customer wants. You have to figure out what their needs are, put it in this dominant buying motive. Real simple. If you're selling homes, you're looking at the amenities of the homes. If there's an HOA, if there's financing involved, if there's a neighborhood, see what any kind of questions that yep. would, would come from your product. Then start listening. What are the needs, wants, and uh, would likes? And find out what their dominant need is and focus it based on what they want, not what you're trying to sell them. People want to, they want to buy, they don't want to be sold. And I think that's really the, the whole theme of this, you know, podcast today is I want to buy something. I don't want to be sold. I don't, I, you know, and when you go in there, having these skills, being able to listen, asking these powerful questions, who, what, how, where, and when those five questions open-ended trying to gather information. That's really, really important as a salesperson. And I think everyone should start from the very top, get pick up a couple of books on NLP. Richard Bandler's written a couple of books, start reading his books. And from there, Get uncomfortable, go to a seminar, go out there and start working out with others. And for me, it's I, I love it because it helps with presentation. It helps with building rapport. You want to do more deals. You want to be able to sit across from somebody and figure out what gets them going. It's with emotions. I think Grant Cardone says, to sell with emotions, close with logic. That's what it really comes down to. You're trying to sell somebody on the emotions, but then obviously you're trying to work in you know, trying to find impact together with same side selling, you want to sell that person something, but you're not going to sell them something that doesn't fit their their needs. It's not just about selling somebody based on their emotions. If that product is not going to work, if you're raising capital for their deal and they want their money back in three years, but you're saying five to seven, walk away from that. Even though you've got the product, the product doesn't fit what they want. Don't be unethical and don't use this to be unethical. So let's keep that. We we shouldn't even have to mention that. No, you, you do though, this. because I think there's a component of sales, especially coming out of the eighties where, you know, people were the sharks and they were going to do anything to close somebody. And that's not what we're talking mm -hmm. about. If, no. if, if the needs are on both sides, but there's a communication barrier yes. uh, because you're, you're basically showing someone something on a piece of paper, but they need to hear it. We're enabling folks to become better communicators with yes. other, other humans. That. That's what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. That's a great recap there, Jake. It's really trying to get communication between two people. Someone yeah. has something to sell and someone needs has a need. Let's put them both together and let's get this product sold so we can both benefit from it. John, I want to say thank you. You expanded my mind today and uh, it's much appreciated. You're a very uh, wise NLP Jedi and we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. Take care. <laughs> okay, thanks guys.